I would like to welcome you all to our program today um, that we um, entitled Fast Forward. Uh, my name is Sabine Ekman, and I'm the Director and Chief Curator at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University. And um, this program um, has the goal uh, to include the practices and the thesis exhibition projects of the MFA um, graduating classes of 2020 and 2021 um, uh, into um, a conversation about broader trends uh, in the contemporary art world. <clears throat> it's a pilot project. Uh, and we have never really done something like that before. Uh, we always uh, wanted to do some kind of public program uh, in connection with uh, the MFA thesis exhibition, uh, um, which the Kemper Art Museum at Washington University is hosting yearly. Um, uh, the uh, students of the Sanford School here at Washington University are always um, showing their work and opening their exhibition in the very beginning of May. And so a public program um, to which we wanted to invite artists uh, from around the country and galleries from around the country was always hard to realize just because it's the same time where all exhibitions around the country are opening and uh, at the same time a lot of art fairs are going on. So um, as you all know, one effect of the pandemic was the concurrent appearance of many, many Zoom webinars. And uh, so we also had the idea to all try this um, remotely. The goal of today's panel is, as I mentioned, to discuss really emerging trends in the broader art world and include the work of three recently graduated students who will present their work today briefly and engage in a conversation with uh, Derek Fordior. We will also talk with Andrea Teschke about the ins and outs um, of the art world how to enter this kind of abstract field as an emerging artist. And lastly, as curator, of course, I'm always interested in this kind of conundrum between um, prioritizing artistic vision and the practicalities and pragmatics of uh, the art market. Um, with this very brief introduction, I would like to introduce um, our panelists today. Um, I'm very, very grateful that you all agreed to participate in this kind of experimental pilot <laughs> program. Uh, Derek Fordure um, uh, was born in Memphis, uh, uh, Tennessee in 1974 to parents of Guyanian heritage. Fordure earned his BA at Moorhouse College, his MA in art education at Harvard University and an MFA in painting at Hunter College. His work has been exhibited at notable institutions nationally and internationally, such as the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Nasher and the Contemporary Art Museum here in St. Louis. And um, that exhibition was uh, also the connecting point uh, to many of our graduate students uh, since uh, 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 Derek did some uh, crits uh, during his residency here in St. Louis. He has received uh, commissions for public projects, including a permanent installation for the Metropolitan Transit Authority of New York City at the 145th Street subway station and the Whitney Museum of American Arts outside the box public art series. He was awarded a 2016 Sugar Hill Children's Museum Artist in Residence, a 2017 Sharpie Valenta Studio Program Award, and the 2018 Deutsche Bank NYFA Fellowship Award. His work has been reviewed in the New York Times, Financial Times, Los Angeles Times, and Hyperallergic. He has also been featured in several publications, such as Wall Street Journal, Vanity Fair, and Forbes Magazine. Fordure was recently appointed the Alex Katz Chair of Paint Painting at the Cooper Union and serves as core critic at Yale University School of Art. 
his works um, is uh, in several important uh, collections, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Brooklyn Museum, the Paris Art Museum in Miami, the Dallas Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And with that, I would like to introduce Andrea Teschke. She is partner as well at one of the art world's leading galleries. Uh, a Petzl Gallery and has more than two decades of experience working with top contemporary artists and estates. In her role at Petzl Gallery in New York, in New York she represents Cosima von Bunin, Derek Fodior, Maria Lasnik, Sarah Morris, and Corinne Wasmuth, to name just a few. Andrea has curated several exhibitions at the gallery, most recently, A Love Letter to a Nightmare, a wonderful group exhibition highlighting contemporary visual nods to historical movements such as surrealism, symbolism, and pop. She holds an MA in International Studies from the Rheinische Friedrich Wilhelms Universität in Bonn, Germany. Next uh, in our list of panelists is Adrian Gonzalez, uh, who creates collages and presents them as paintings, mixed media assemblages, and sculpture that incorporate references to a multi-parted viewpoint of Spanglish in the United States as an act of making. He is also a collaborative printer with expertise in a wide range of print processes. He worked at Flying Horse Editions as a master printer from 2011 to 2019, where it was his responsibility to provide complex technical expertise and individual creative support to widely exhibited artists. He holds a BFA from the University of Central Florida and an MFA, he just graduated, congratulations, from Washington University in St. Louis. Next in line is Olga Okbara. Um, she uh, earned her MFA already in 2020. Also congratulations to you, Olga, uh, Lola. Uh, she is a cultural worker and visual artist working and living in Chicago, Illinois. She's currently a resident at UChicago Arts and Public Life, Center for the Race, Public uh, Politics and Culture, where she's investigating radical disruptions of viewership in the context of African diasporas. In addition, she's a current fellow at the Hyde Park Arts Center in Ceramic Arts, and co-founder of Artists in the Room, a community engaged collective noted for cultivating connections between emerging and established artists in the Midwest. And lastly, Jessica Bremer is an artist who just graduated uh, from uh, the Sam Fox School. Congratulations, Jessica. Um, and she works at the intersection of painting, sculpture, and installation exploring themes of gender, social relations, and environmentalism through fantastical narratives. She received her BFA from the University of Missouri, Columbia in 2014. And as I mentioned, her MFA just now. She was also recently featured in New American Paintings. I really would like uh, to thank all of you very much for agreeing to participate today and also mention and thank Leslie Markley, curator for public art here at the museum for his help to organizing this panel. And I would like to ask all um, attendees um, to please feel free to ask uh, questions at any time by entering your question into the chat feature. I will watch the chat feature and uh, whenever it seems appropriate and the right moment, I will um, ask uh, your questions. I will also be responsible to keep us on a timetable. Um, the event uh, is supposed to last uh, for an hour. Before we go to the uh, presentations of uh, the emerging artists here among us and Derek's um, dialogue with them, uh, I wanna start a little bit with talking to Andrea for um, some minutes, um, whose really exhibition, Love Letter to a Nightmare, I found fascinating last year and I thought you did a fantastic um, uh, job. And uh, I, we, we just wanted to talk maybe a little bit about your um, uh, understanding uh, or 
your observations, if there are any kind of obvious and very visible trends you see in the practice of emerging artists today, one could uh, single out or uh, about which people talk uh, just to get us um, uh, immersed into the world of making art. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I think the one observation we probably have is that um, formal concerns don't matter so much anymore. And it's not so much anymore about whether something is figuration, abstraction, but things have gone so much more in all directions. I mean, with NFTs just being one small part of a very different way of, you know, making art. Um, but I think in our case, since everything has just gone so much more online and online promotion and content, ha content has become so much more important, um, well, it has its good and bad sides because on the one hand, people can't experience art or didn't experience art so much more in person. But um, on the other hand, it was also possible to discover so many more artists that one may have not seen otherwise by just, you know, not having an online viewing room, for example, or the option to see online presentations. And I think um, just to get back to the exhibition that you mentioned, Sabina, from last year, one of the artists, her name is Miriam Banani, who was in the show, her work was actually something that um, I and we all saw on uh, Instagram because she did this little, these little films in collaboration with another artist about two lizards. And that was something that really captivated my attention in a way because it was all during the lockdown. And so she was somebody who we then invited to um, participate in our group exhibition last summer. So, you know, in a way you can discover other things online. So that's kind of a trend, I would say that artists um, show themselves differently on social media and online platforms. And it's something that we, of course, had to work with more heavily during the past year, where we had many online viewing rooms and art fairs that were just virtual, um, which was interesting. I mean, I, I do still prefer the in-person experience, but it worked for the, for the time being. And is there anything where you could where you would differ, differentiate uh, today where you would say really multidisciplinarity is um, what is um, a dominating approach to making art or um, is it more on an equal footing with um, all other uh, mediums uh, such as I think it's pretty much on, on an equal footing. I mean, narrative paintings are definitely something that um, that are currently that that speak to a lot of people and we, but I do think it's all on an equal footing. I think there's more collaboration between artists, which is really great and which may have also happened during the course of the past year and the pandemic. And, um, but in general, I, I do think, you know, that, um, that yeah, those formal concerns are not so much in, in the foreground anymore. Would you say that that changes also gallery programs? It might, you know, I mean, it's not such a quick thing to change gallery programs, maybe over time. Um, and I think gallery programs do, I mean, we look at a lot of artists through that get presented to us by either other artists or a lot of our artists teach at different universities and they, you know, they present us artists or students that they find very interesting. And over time, I think programs change that way. And this is also how we, you know, look at artists by, having museum directors point someone out or by other artists bringing them to our attention. And this is how our program slowly develops over time. Great. Um, if there are no questions from the audience, if there's any question, there's nothing in the chat. I think uh, we could start, it's time uh, to start uh, with the presentations of the individual artists. And um, Adrian, I would uh, like to ask you to go first. Oops. Oh, Lola can go first too. I, have, I just did it alphabetically. <laughs> if that works better with the, um, with the PowerPoint, sorry about that. Lola, would you be ready to go? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, sorry about this. Um, my, my mistake. 
Um, so what you see here on a screen before you is um, a video rendition of the installation I have up at the Kemper Museum with Labor and Love. Um, it's a mixed media installation that encompasses an object of both a, sh a chandelier and a tree stump. Um, the chandelier is um, embellished in crystals, rhinestones, earrings, hair beads, um, things of that nature. Um, and it's also compromised, comprom comprised of uh, 16 uh, Mrs. Butterworth syrup bottles. And so adorned with varying size rhinestones, I'm hinting at a, a labor using sugar as a byproduct, um, syrup as a byproduct of sugar, of brown sugar in particular. And so with that, I'm hinting at a labor, um, both of my ancestors um, and both of the current state of artists today. Um, through a sexual labor. And so um, the video, there's a voiceover on the video and throughout the video, I am kind of paying homage to um, both my ancestors um, and the labor they put in to the US economy um, through their sexual labor, both sexually and physically. And so, in a perfect world, this would be functioning um, as a fountain. Um, although the Kemper doesn't allow liquids, I <laughs> yeah, the Kemper doesn't allow liquids, so I was I was I had to compromise and create a video to kind of get that that idea fully across. And so the idea is that um, there is a liquid substance that is funneled through the chandelier. Um, the liquid is comprised of um, syrup, glitter, um, clay, and um, a, a dirt particles. And so it's funneled through the chandelier and it hits the tree stump. And inside the, the fabricated tree stump, there is um, a system of circulation to where um, the liquid is dropped into the tree stump and it's funneled out through spigots that are on the side of the trees. Um, that then gets poured into the buckets that are held on the side of the tree and to be recirculated through, through the, uh, the chandelier, uh, which requires an activation um, through a, a human activation. So someone would have to activate it and, and keep the tree um, circulating. Um, so the idea is that this installation is a, is a performance of objects and it stands to create some type of um, due process, if you will, um, kind of going back in time and allowing a space for my ancestors to, to kind of have their labor poured back into self, um, essentially. So um, I was able to kind of still have those elements um, in the gallery, even though it's not actually functioning. I have the video to accompany it. And I also have the smell of maple syrup that kind of clouds the, the entire museum uh, space or this space here. And so with that, I hope to kind of ignite or kind of activate this, this idea um, that labor can be put into self and it doesn't have to always be in performed for someone else. It could be performed for self. Uh, uh, my desire to subvert labor for self is, is seen in this work here. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I'll say about it, but. Great, thanks so much, Lola. Uh, is this is this time for me to jump in or no? Yes, yes. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Okay, uh, Lola, thank you for sharing your work. Um, thank you. I I think I remember uh, visiting you with you in your studio. Yes, yes. Uh, and I don't think I don't think the work was quite this far. I, I must tell you that uh, I think that. It's a very striking object. I'm very intrigued 
Um, I don't have other reference points, which I really enjoy. Um, I think that the presence of the tree stump is very powerful as an object to invoke um, all sorts of histories. Um, I think instantly of North American plantations. I also think about rubber plantations in Africa. Uh, I'm really disappointed that the Kemper does not allow liquids. <laughs> Uh, and I think that's not true because they allow to use painting. So this is some strange thing that I want to weigh in with all the powers that be that we make considerations because I really think that this would be even more powerful with the drip because that invokes so much around perspiration and bodily fluids and uh, it really becomes anthropomorphic and uh, it becomes uh, a spectacle. Uh, so I would encourage you uh, to, you know, when you get beyond school, to, to make this even more messy. Um, I'm instantly reminded of Kara Walker's Sugar Babies um, at the Domino uh, plant where she used uh, sugar to make these, uh, these, these, these little black babies that were holding baskets and they melted in the hot sun and it was so visceral, the smell of sorghum and sugar. And so I think this has that kind of potential to evoke. One thing I would caution you against, if I may, and I must because you're in school and well, you're, well, you're a recent graduate and you're still open to, to, to these kinds of critiques is make sure that everything is taken through your filter. And I think you've done this very well. I think the, 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 the life of the stump invokes place and, and has a, you know, a, some tactility and, and seems to have been extracted from something narrative, but that pail is very new. And it looks like something that you might have gotten just off the rack at Home Depot. And I really want that to go through your filter. So whether that's dipping that in tar or leaving it in syrup for a couple of days, thinking about artists like Leonardo Drew, who has a tub on the top of a building in Texas, even though his studio is in uh, Brooklyn, and he puts large objects in a vat in the sun and water for them to age and then returns after three months. So really thinking about being able to use um, nature and time now that you're not in school and not restricted to those confines, I think this has a lot of power. Those jewels are kind of new and clean, which could also invoke something about the domestic, um, but make sure every single moment is considered um, so that the power of narrative is really uh, invoked. But I think this is a really strong piece I'm excited to see what you've done with this. I think it has presence um, and, and I'm really excited for, for what the rest of your practice holds. Thank you, thank you. I, um, I, did, I did talk uh, about Kara Walker's work in reference to this piece um, because of the um, layered use of the byproducts of sugar, right? The brown sugar. Um, I also talked about Marielle Millie Young who was a black feminist scholar. Mm -hmm. um, in her A Taste for Brown Sugar, uh, Black Women in Pornography. So those two references overlapped and it helped me kind of turn this into a space where I can try to reclaim um, both labor through the body and, and through, through physical pleasure. So the idea that an aphorism by Black women as they internalize their own eroticism um, is explored here in both of the works of Walker and, and Mary L. Miller Young. So um, I appreciate you making that reference on your own. And the bucket itself, I try, I try to kick it around. <laughs> and, and, you know, but it, it, I do, I, I do understand that, that critique and I accept it because it's true. Yeah. Well, thank Good. you. Set it on fire, you know, get us in a while. You know, everything is your element. I know those readings too. Uh, that book on pornography is wonderful. Um, and so I, I, and I feel that more importantly, uh, the rigor of your thinking is evident in the object and the choices that you made and the form is distinct. And I think that's really hard to get to, to make something that feels unique. Um, so uh, I, I'm really excited about this. There, there, there's a work by Nary Ward who uses codfish um, and, uh, you know, uh, referencing the Caribbean, uh, Benepe, 
uh, show P. There's a South African artist that was in the Venice, Venice Biennale who used mud um, in this way. And I, I just really think that what you're doing around the body by not implicating the body um, uh, or using the presence of it, uh, but, but referencing, you know, nipples and uh, breasts. And I just really think this is really strong. And I just want to encourage you uh, to continue in this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I really <clears throat> take the criticism too. We should have definitely allowed liquids. So <laughs> next time <clears throat> we'll do better uh, on that. Um, I think um, it, we are sort of on time to go to the next. Um, uh, Orlula, if you have one more really important question for Derek, otherwise we would go to Adrian. Um, I'll save my questions for later. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, with that, Adrian, we would uh, come to your presentation. Hi, hello. Um, so my, I think of my works as collages and I, I present them as translucent paintings, sculpture and mixed media assemblages that incorporate reference to, to Spanglish as an act of making. And Spanglish is the collision of English and, and Spanish that many people my age in the US um, speak fluently. Um, either created or inherited language, um, be that a proper language or not. So in, in the, work, the works in the show, I wanted to create uh, an unconventional space of works that are on the walls and move away from the walls. Uh, and these works look like uh, rectilinear paintings and sculptures, but are skewed, um, are a skewed interpretation of space, horizons, objects, figures, and depth. And I reimagine um, and reimagine them in ways of seeing through and around them, um, where horizontal and vertical planes collapse into one another. Um, and then, but you see sculptures, objects, and figures, and bits and pieces scattered throughout the installation as you would see them like walking down the street. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, as an artist and collector and Spanglish speaker, um, wonky grid lover, I construct and deconstruct and reconstruct by adding and peeling away layers, fitting and, re and refitting images and objects where they might seem unlikely. Um, for me, this represents unlikely fragments fit together like Spanglish, like collage, like building, um, developing um, architectures where figures are placed around and against natural and unnatural landscapes. And um, I like to call these unlikely fragments manchitas, which translates to stains. And, um, I developed this through the, looking through the etymology of the word fragment and then translating it and mistranslating it and misinterpreting it, which eventually came to the word manchita. Um, and then I like, to, I like to use this as a reflection of, of how I make decisions in the studio. So in the work, there are fragments of drawings, prints, Google images, words, and objects um, from the streets and the studios. Um, I use a very uh, haptic uh, but rational strategies and materials, slicing pictures and cutting down pieces of wood, gluing them back together, or screwing them back together as a former sense of um, bilingualism. Um, so this is an investigation for me about Spanglish in the US um, and my position around contemporary issues and concerns I have around culture and linguistic hybridities by, ma by making. Um, so the, to the use of these transparent and translucent materials, um, I hide in plain sight the inner systems of the structures that hold the works together. Um, so on the wall, they're a little more shallow investigation of their inner workings, but in the sculpture pieces that are in the front, they're more, more open and you, um, you can walk around it, see through it and past it. So kind of re in, in a way, a, a reinventing of the imaginative process, uh, a reflection of the kind of intermediate, spa intermediate stages of representation and abstraction, or, or even consider that in between languages. Um, next slide, please. So um, to me, the, the visual work that I make is uh, thinking in one language or speaking another, uh, words that start in English but end in Spang, uh, Spanish, um, sound like English but are Spanish or vice versa. The words look misspelled um, and are, but are used in everyday conversation. Uh, Spanglish is idiosyncratic and that's how I like to build my practice on. I collect materials around me, um, some I find, some I make, some belong to me and some belong to others. Um, but to me, this is what uh, being an artist and uh, being bilingual in the U.S. means to me um, in our contemporary time. So quickly, just this is um, a, my non-imaginary friend, Bizarro, and he was inspired by uh, a tradition of burning dolls that represent people or, or 
ill, Ill ideas um, from the from a year that you would burn at, at midnight of New Year's Eve, and that represents the burning away of the past. So, um, as a child, I believe these dolls are called manigotes, and uh, as a child, I believe these figures were haunted, especially while they were burning. And this this kind of this reflected the idea of, of this character in the Superman comic books named Bizarro, um, and he was used as a mirror image from a grotesque mirror image from a mm-hmm. universe. So. Um, bizarro is actually, you know, the Spanish translation of bizarre, or or is it, you know, because um, that's what you would think it is. Um, so here's an effigy of myself um, that kind of work, lives between the real and the non-real. Thanks. Can I just, uh, Derek, before you start, I just got a message that the chat seems to be disabled, so people cannot put questions in. Um, if somebody could check on that. Um, Sorry for the interruption. Go ahead, Derek. Okay. Uh, well, Adrian, thank you so much uh, for sharing your work. Um, I I really appreciate uh, the the rigor in your thinking. Um, you know, I really feel at a disadvantage looking at installation work, but you know, in terms of photography, but. Uh, you know, I'm going to do my best, uh, you know, to, you know, uh, give you a reaction. Um, I think that um, you're having a very important conversation right now. I think your voice um, as, you know, uh, an American to an immigrant kid that, you know, has relationship to and I'm not sure that whether you mentioned that, that, that your country of origin or the country your family comes from. Um, would you share that with me? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Ecuador and Puerto Rico. Okay, all right. So, um, so I think there's just a, a very prescient time in terms of uh, the interest around this conversation. Uh, so I'm excited to have you making art and to Uh, for you to be, you know, working out of this uh, liminality, you know, between spaces, even the space of your home and and your public life or your your lived experience. Um, I just watched a preview of Lin-Manuel, his latest show, uh, In the Heights, Um, and it's incredible. So it's going to come out, everybody should see it. It's crazy, but he's using uh, the medium of musicals, which I hate musicals to death. (laughs) <laughs> but, but he was able to bring you into this world with such specificity um, that it becomes universal. Um, and that kind of um, connection from the personal through to the universal is really important, uh, particularly in the kind of work that you're making. I think the challenge for me from what I'm seeing uh, is that there's a bit of a, a, a dichotomy just formally, we're speaking. We're not talking context yet. Context yet. Um, formally, there are two languages. One language of sort of the grid. And can we go back one so I can uh, go back a slide so I can see? It was a wider shot of everything. Is that possible? Can we go back a slide? Okay, great, thank you. So the, the, the wall work and the freestanding work um, have this language of um, maybe minimalism, uh, certainly abstraction, um, and uh, it makes me think of the work of maybe Tamashi Jackson, um, who's an artist who's working around community work and she uses you know plastic and layering. Um, there's a little bit of David Sally and uh, Rosenquist with these like um, you know, multiple images. So you're, you're really pulling from, you know, modernism and, and contemporary art in this, in this kind of 2D language. And then there's the presence of these, um, you know, the, the bodies, you know, that have this ritualistic history, but they're fashioned in contemporary clothing. And I see bits and parts of them uh, in the freestanding work, but it seems to be two disparate le- conversations or languages formally and I'm not quite certain at this point that the relationship between those two um, is fully resolved. And so I think that you have, you know, 
an issue that I did when I was in school in that I, I was doing so many things at one time and I wanted the work to be a container for all these ideas. Uh, and I'm gonna encourage you to think about how some of these bodies of work or series could live separate and apart from one another. Uh, the relationship between the wall paintings and the freestanding are great. I think the freestanding works are really beautiful and they're intriguing. And I think that form of, uh, you know, the, the, the walk around painting is one that has not been explored quite enough, even though it's, it's not an original gesture. Um, but I think the presence of, of, of the body um, in relation to those is just not, in my opinion, at this point, resolved enough. I would like to consider this guy on his own terms. Um, it makes me think of the work of Luis Flores. I don't know if you know Luis Flores, who uses these body, um, their self-portraits where they're quilted and they're stuffed and dressed as full, full bodies. He goes with Matthew Brown Gallery in LA. Uh, there's no way as a Latino man that you're gonna make these works in the art market and people are not gonna talk about Luis Flores. It's not possible. Um, Oscar Marito also just did a work that became very popular um, where he stuffed these bodies and he was having an immigration conversation. Uh, I think this is part of what people don't want to hear, um, you know, because we're all so original. When I first started ma making my work and I had black male figures and colorful backgrounds, people talked about Kehinde Wiley right away. And I couldn't be further from what he was doing. But you have to also be sensitive around the space you're coming into. And this is for everybody listening. Think about it like you're an artist that's coming into a room in which people are already talking. Certain artists have been invited into that room. And one of the things that is gonna help you get into that room is how distinct your voice is. That you are using a language that no one else is using, or if you're using it, you're using it with great awareness of what else has been said or done around that. So I want you to really think about this form um, think about you know who you are, what you're making. Uh, I love what you said about how these are made, um, the process, the ritual. I'm very attracted to. I almost want to see some of that making because the way you arrive at this form uh, is not fully evident to me, even though it's a very attractive uh, figure on its own. So I think the resolve between these two languages is something that you should consider either working further integrating a cohesive relationship. How do you think about it? You're still with me or do you out of the room? Uh, you're, you broke up for me for a bit there at the end. For me too. Did you in there? Oh, I'm about to say. I think you're frozen, Derek. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Adrian, okay. can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, how do you respond to any of that? Um, I agree with the, the, the culmination of, of everything coming together. Like this, this exhibition or the work in the exhibition came together as these ideas coming together. Um, and it, and a, a conversation I've had is like, this is a springboard to the next steps. Like these are, these could become different projects. To so try to get them all those ideas into the exhibition was a, cha a challenge or, or that I wanted to take on. But yeah, now I see different lines of work coming through this, the, the wall pieces, the, the floor pieces, the sculptures. Um, and I, that I'm excited by that for the next step and to, to add the voice to that. Yeah, and I think, I think that you have a very good problem and that you have too many things going on. I think not enough is a more serious problem, <laughs> right? So too, too many means this is a question of establishing a hierarchy, or maybe you know showing some restraint. There's also tremendous pressure for a thesis show to really, you know, bring all the gusto and and, and to show it all. But I think you you would be well served in your years right after school to think about, hey, you know what? Maybe I don't need four elements. Maybe two work. Maybe one is strong enough. Um, and but I think you have a lot here, and I want to stress to you. 
that your voice, your voice is important right now. Um, so this conversation is one that we want to advance. The Spanglish conversation I love because it touches many communities. Um, and I think uh, this is really potent. So I want you to continue to work there, but please do look at the work of Tomashi Jackson. Please do look at the work of, Lu of Luis Flores um, and look at Oscar Murillo's most recent project and you move away from that, figure out how to get your own lane um, because I don't want people making those associations um, and thinking that they got it uh, and they're wrong. And particularly as people of color, that happens to us even more so. So make sure that, that you find a way to make this uh, distinct, but I think you're on a wonderful path. And I think this is a really strong uh, set of works that have a lot of potential. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So, Thanks so much, Derek. I think um, uh, to uh, keep uh, our schedule, we move on to Jessica. Uh, we also have an interesting question in the chat, but I will, um, uh, come to that later once uh, Jessica has presented and Derek responded to Jessica's work. Um, so Jessica, it's yours. Sure. Um, okay, so in my recent project that you see here, I created a fantastical narrative about this otherworldly realm called the Garden of Extraterrestrial Delights. And in this realm, Earth's delights are transformed into extraterrestrial beings. These beings decided to absorb whatever they could before leaving Earth, um, mainly from the excess of human consumption. And all of these beings live under a geodesic dome where the visitor is invited to walk through the space while listening to ambient sounds paired with a meditation that you can't hear um, virtually right now, but um, the meditation is on human existence from a computer generated voice named Heather. And as the visitor walks through the dome, they are confronted with these beings that are unlike themselves, but also remnants of their own existence. So more specifically, um, the beings are made from styrofoam to go containers, drainage tubing, knickknacks from secondhand stores like Tupperware, wigs, fake plants, hamster tunnels, rubber tongues, most of which are covered in handmade paper clay, only exposing a glimpse of what's underneath. And I painted the skin of these beings and the patterns that evoke um, amoeba and cellular, cellular structures of the living world as if another life form is living on the surface of these beings. And this was a, sort of a, a symbol of a symbiosis between species. And the organic, organic lines and shapes um, suggest plants and the activity of the living world. Like some are visibly growing out of the ground, sprouting, um, reproducing clones or offspring. And the amalgamation of all these parts um, question what will come of the atoms and molecules left over, you know, if humans choose, or when maybe humans choose to build uh, amusement parks or mansions on Mars. So how did I come to this work? Um, it was mainly, you know, making all this work during the pandemic. I was, you know, living in isolation from the rest of the world, like we all were um, feeling rather disconnected and spending time in nature. I began to question um, how hierarchies of thinking have alienated people from the, the world around us. Um, for instance, you know, when we place ourselves at the top of a bio, bio, uh, biology, uh, biology, oh my gosh, biology, you know. Biological, biology. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> Um, we failed to conceive um, non-humans as having the capacity for emotions or consciousness. So take, for example, in the English language, um, the words for personhood, he, she, and they are reserved for human beings, but omit plants, animals, landscapes, and objects. And through my research, um, the, these ways of categorizing reinforced dominance and hierarchies resulting in a lack of reverence for the natural world. So I question if these hierarchies were demolished, um, perhaps humans would have more reverence and respect for their fellow inhabitants on earth. 
And in the end, through this confrontation, um, the visitor um, confronts um, these beings that are unlike you or me. And the visitor is provided a place for contemplation of their own bodies in space. And overall, I hoped to provide a place of bewilderment, yet wonder to promote an expanded sense of interconnectedness and reverence for the microscopic and commonplace natural wonders of the world around us. So I will end there. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, thanks for uh, coming through with the bio <laughs> biological. Oh my gosh, I still can't say it. <laughs> Jessica, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I, your, your images stayed with me. I looked at these, uh, you know, in advance, and I, I immediately perked up. Um, I'm someone who really loves world building. Um, I certainly applaud your effort. It's a very um, difficult thing to do to three, think in three dimensions and to take up space and um you know to think in 4d in fact um so i'm really excited about the ambition and the scale of your thinking um and i want to encourage that um, it's not easy but it's wonderful uh, as i looked at this several artists came to mind that might that you might have already known that i just want to encourage you to look at and hopefully experience their work um, immediately as you talked about you know the imagination uh, the imaginative uh, being of Heather and that kind of thing. I thought about Trenton Doyle Hancock um, and his mounds and the mound bursts and this kind of world building and, and, and Trenton doesn't hold back at all. And I think that's great. Um, the use of plants and the biomorphic, I thought about Camille Inro. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen Camille's work. Her last name is H-E-N-R-O-T. Um, I think she's a French artist, um, but she does a lot of classifications in plants and uh, plant life. Um, and uh, Lauren Halsey is another artist that shows in Los Angeles uh, with David Kordansky, where I show she uh, does world building with this kind of paper mache and um, all these forms and you can inhabit them and enter and out, out of those spaces. Um, and then Ernesto Neto. I don't know if you know Ernesto Neto's work, but uh, he uses a different material where things are quilted, but he makes all these tents and there are these dripping forms and, um, you know, there's that. So Ernesto Neto is a good, you know, point that I want to talk about. He makes these worlds, let's stay on this image right here. Um, he, he makes these worlds and uh, to me, what ties them together are the, 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 the quilting. I want to talk about how the the making, the way that you construct these images. And I, I just want to say separately, I love the conversation of the biomorphic. I love the conversation of the uh, kind of um, artifice and nature and the way those two uh, meet. That's a conversation artists have been having for a long time. I think it's even more present in the space of, of climate change and environment. It was considered. So I think uh, the conversation you're having is important. Um, I think coming from a woman artist is even more exciting. This is not the space of men considering other worlds and universes. So this is something I really want to encourage you on. Uh, but the, when the, the form can carry the, the content, that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, I know, know that you're limited when you're in school in terms of the materials that you work with and that kind of thing. Uh, but I want to really push you Think about artists like Mike Kelly um, and his installations when he makes the Superman worlds and the crystals and that kind of thing. And I know you're on a budget, and so this is a little unfair, um, but really think about whether, uh, you know, paper mache, and I know this is, you know, again, I don't know all the material, but the, the, the material that you're using to arrive at this, I want to know if there's a way that that can carry content more. Um, what I see now feels a bit like um, scholastic in terms of the materials, and that can be intentional. You can be purposefully invoking that feeling of kind of poster paints and, you know, but you need to be in control of that if, if that's what you want. Or think about how you can get all this goopy, weird, gloppity stuff with materials that might also 
invoke associations that you're interested in, right? So whether that be resin or gels or food or things that disintegrate, um, I really want a more visceral connection to the materials because I think the conversation right now is probably a bit ahead. I think you're at the beginnings of the form, but you really need to, I really wanna get you around installations that change your body temperature. I want you to go inside of these worlds that have been created by, by artists that have had more resources and really push you into the space of thinking about how not just with the occasional plants that exist, but these goopity goopity forms and these eyeballs, how can we use materials that are, are provocative? How do you think about that? Um, yeah, so my original intention was like to create, you know, a, like have a natural like ground, um, like sand or moss, but shout out to the Kemper for <laughs> not allowing that, but um, that's okay for the future. Um, but yeah, I definitely wanted to integrate um, like more of like the natural world meets like this world of imagination. Um, and the reason, I mean, I, I started making this, the handmade paper clay during like at home because I was locked out of my studio from the pandemic. And I just kind of gravitated to it because it was another kind of like stew of materials um, that I felt like matched all these like odds and ends. Um, and I liked the, yeah, I liked that I didn't have to like go purchase much, you know? Um, yeah. And yeah. I, I, I'm a painter or I, you know, primarily in painting and I like, I, I gravitated to like the papery quality and like the rocky um, textures and yeah. Yeah, me too. And I, I understand that. And I look, you know, it's just so unfair to you guys, the class of 2020 and 21 you know, in terms of like COVID, like the fact that you guys could pull this off is just beyond me. So I realize that, you know, you kind of did this with one hand behind your back. It's a wonderful uh, ambition and scale and the way your thinking works. But I really want to, you know, push you a little further. Also, we think about worlds as bodies standing on solid ground. Uh, think about what happens if we in we inhabit this geodesic space and maybe they're just hanging forms and maybe you change the relationship to gravity. So you're really pulling from the natural world, but your aspiration is to take us into another world and think about how your presumptions might be a one-to-one -one with the natural world and how we can up in that even more. Great work though. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I want to, we don't have so much time left, so I want to be careful. We have like seven to 10 minutes left. Nevertheless, I want to read this one question, which is in this uh, chat uh, by Sarah Knight. She asked, in regards to all um, of Adrian, Jessica, and Lola's work, how do each of the artists and use physical immersion in their installation? to create a corporal knowledge? And how did the artists navigate ideas of immersive installation in the pandemic and a shift to virtual experience? So in one way or the other, they're all issues, you know, which have been um, uh, touched upon by uh, Derek or by your uh, presentations. Uh, but if each of you wanna say one word uh, or one sentence in relation to that, I would like to invite you. Uh, I also would like to keep a little time for um, our uh, uh, talk about the art world. I myself, I, I tend to gravitate towards um, tantalizing elements and playing on the ambiguity of the body and the object. So using those elements to kind of implicate the viewer and, and kind of ask questions like how does one think of objects in relation or an approximation to, to, to the body mm -hmm. and how that differs. And so that's how I, I come to kind of create a corporeal knowledge. Um, still haven't figured out um, how to navigate that in a pandemic, however, or in a, a virtual experience shift. I'm still learning about NFTs and such. So we'll check back later with that. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was a very thoughtful answer. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
You don't really have to answer. It was just an open, open question. Otherwise, I um, would. It's up to you. If you, I'm not sure if you want to answer or not. I'll answer really quick. Um, to me, the like the standing pieces, I, I called them human size, and I really wanted to to show that fact that because also the work on the walls were really hard to show over Zoom or videos. So have, having the interaction with people, especially for photographs, I wanted the body to be immersed in it so we can actually get a sense of scale or a sense of how they look, how they live in space with this idea of an installation. Maybe we switch and use the remaining time to talk a little bit <clears throat> uh, about how to now, since you all have graduated, um, how to enter or not enter. Uh, the art world, I would have, you know, on the one hand, this is Andrea's uh, a special field. So we definitely would want her to talk maybe a little generally about that kind of process, but it was would also be great to hear from you, Derek, of how that worked for yourself uh, uh, after graduating. Uh, so that maybe we have these two connections, uh, one to um, a leading gallerist and one to a leading artist of how these experiences um, may happen. Well, maybe I can give some examples from artists that um, that I know, that we know, or that have worked at the gallery or with the gallery before. So I think that really your strongest resource is really your um, fellow artists, as well as professors or, you know, people you know uh, that you're friends with. I mean, one big piece of advice that somebody recently, I heard somebody say is try not to burn any bridges. So kind of keep an open mind, try to stay really diplomatic, uh, not with your art, but, but with your interactions. So, you know, in your art, do whatever, you know, you want to experience and just, you know, I think it's really important to be very experimental, speculative, and just try to do whatever you can. But when it comes to your personal connections, then I think your fellow artists are a huge resource to you because certain things, it also depends a bit, of course, not everybody lives in these major cities, New York or LA. So, but in other cities, there's things that are possible as well. So you can maybe connect with fellow artists or rent a space, not for a lot of money, but you know, if you all chip in together and just, kind of make your own little exhibitions and promote those. You can promote those for free on social media and, and just to get your word, you know, get the word out there and get people, invite people to come in. And I think that's where, where the Kemper, or I mean, Zabina, she has a huge network of contacts also. You know, if you connect with your professors at school or um, where, you know, with your fellow artists and have everybody reach out to their social network and put up some shows and, and just you know promote each other and try to collaborate with others. And I think that's how a lot of people really um, that we work with have started out by having been curated into group shows and then people go and see those group shows. And if it's currently not possible in person, it might be possible via an online viewing room or virtually. So, you know, things, I think you have, a lot more chances now, even if you don't live in these big cities to really get your art out there and try to promote yourself. So I think that would be one piece of advice as, you know, for somebody to start out their career. If you really want to pursue this career, if you want to go a diff down a different track in the art world, it's all possible. But, you know, the more people you know, I think the more connections you'll start building. And, and that's how you can get your work out there. But with your work, you know, don't make any compromises. And I would also suggest not to look too much towards the art market when it comes to the market, because the, what the market wants is basically to make money. So don't be too, too much um, <laughs> concerned with guiding your own work towards something that might make money just because then you're not really true to yourself anymore. I think the best way is to just do whatever you're best at and connect with others. So that's I don't know if that's helpful, but I think it's one piece of advice that I might give. Derek might have some additional clues here, but that's something that I would say from our perspective. Andrea, I think that's wonderful advice. I think, um, look, I think you guys already started um, because you've got your work. I mean, thank goodness they, 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 they've called good people. Andrea is the kind of uh, dealer that's going to remember work that she's seen. I think 
a lot of times artists want it to happen quickly. You know, we've been hungry so long, we want to hit. And I think your generation especially is about success, like, right, you know, kind of like right away. And the, this, the problem with that is we have an image of what success looks like. And so whenever any dealer comes along, we're ready because we're ready to kind of get this story going. Um, what you guys are doing best is that the work is good. And I know this is only an inkling of your colleagues and peers from 2021 and 2020 and 2021. You have a rigorous program. The work is actually good. I would not say that if it were not, not being flattering. And I think that the quality of work is number one. And you can lose sight of that. You can get into the parties and hanging out. And I know this person and this person knows that person. It's all bunk. At the end of the day, the quality of that work, what happens when people stand in front of it, what experience they have, that is what's going to matter most. So spend most of your time making incredible work because what happens when the work is incredible is that people get excited and then they pull other people in. So make sure that the center of your world is that work and be very honest with yourself about that. Uh, about the quality of it. The work around it does require you to get out of your head a little bit and you know have points of contact, but I echo 100% what uh, Andrea said in that artists are your greatest resources. I say very quickly, and I'll say this, for artists, I talk to artists all the time, every week, know what the people that are coming around you want, okay? Dealers generally wanna know, and you can close your ears, Andrea, <laughs> when, it, when a dealer comes to visit your studio, they generally want to know, can I sell this? That's their question. And it's not that they're not interested in other things, but that is, that is a question that, that is very important to dealers. Curators want to know, can I show this? Can I build a conversation around this? Can I build a public uh, space around this? Collectors want to know, can I buy this? That's generally what they want to know. Artists, we don't want anything. We just want to know that you're doing okay. And so make sure that your circle is full of people that have similar concerns. Uh, I encourage you guys to work for other artists. I worked for the artist Micheline Thomas for a year for no pay. And it was as valuable as my MFA. I just said, hey, I'm gonna come one day a week because I can't work, afford to work five days for no money, but I can afford to work one day for no money. But just being in her studio, listening to the numbers, listening, eavesdropping was such a valuable lesson to me. So thinking about how you guys can work for other artists, even if it's remotely, hey, I'll organize your archive, I'll organize your files. It gets you closer to the action and it builds a relationship. I have tremendous artists that work in my studio every day and I'm eager to help them. So think about that, um, how you can spend your time getting closer to uh, the kinds of things that uh, will inform your journey. Thank you so much, Derek. That was fantastic um, advice. Um, it, we are a little bit over time. If there are any pressing ish uh, questions from the three of you, we'll give give it maybe another five minutes. I Lula, have, I see that you want to ask something. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I work primarily in sculpture and I see a difference. I work in an array of mediums, but I do see a difference in um, how I sell sculptures versus um, maybe 2D works like photographs or lenticular prints. Um, are people, um, I guess my question is, are, are people buying sculptures or is it something that typically doesn't sell or does scale matter in that sense? Um, well, from our point of view, I mean, of course, uh, sculpture sells just as well as paintings sell. There are certain criteria that private collectors take into consideration. I think when they, depends on the size of the sculpture, but in general, yes, of course, I mean, people buy sculpture and some people don't even necessarily live with the art that they buy. They just love the art and then they buy it. And if they don't have the space for it at the time, they made a, a might at a later point. So I, I don't think I would, I mean, I would definitely give you the piece of advice of not to let that influence your practice because you should still go ahead and make all the sculptures that you want from a sales point of view, of course. I mean, there's probably a lot more people that can fit it 
2D work, a photograph, a painting into their homes when it comes to living with the work. But in general, if that's part of your practice, then you should definitely just go ahead and continue doing that, of course, because it's really great what you do. So I would continue with that. But you know, from a sales point of view, yes, it's more difficult to, to, to place a sculpture in a way uh, than a painting in a private collection. But museums, I think, have other, it's not the same, depends on who buys it, of course. Yeah, I, I'm going to say, in addition, I, I mean, that's great advice from Andrea. You know, if you're a sculptor and that's where your heart is and that's where the, the juice is and what you're doing, then you go wholehearted. I think about some artists that I love, like Alicia Claude or Carol Beauvais. I mean, most of their practice is sculptural. I mean, 80 percent, 90 percent of what they're doing. Um, it is it is harder, though. I mean, when I was in graduate school, I got some great advice from an artist I won't mention who's, uh, you know, out there. And uh, and I was just like you, Lola, I was doing both, you know, and he said, hey, I'm going to tell you something. Don't forget this. The money is on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, wa I wasn't going to say that. But she, she, would never, can. <laughs> she, would, she, would, she would never be as crass. She would never be as crass, which is why I love to work with her. She would never be as crap. My job is to keep it funky with you guys, okay? So everybody, everybody that's making sculpture cannot also do 2D work, but if you are the kind of artist that sincerely can do both, and you're not just dialing it in on the wall just because you think there's money there, because that's not gonna work, but if, 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 your, if your practice is one that can move between, particularly in the early days when you need to pay rent, uh, small things like eat, um, it's, not a bad, it's not a bad idea to have things that are easily uh, consumed, even if it's from your friends that just want to support you. So be practical to some extent. Um, if your job, if your goal is that you want to live 100% on doing this, or make sure you get a job at Starbucks or somewhere so that you can take care of your base needs and then make the wild sculptures that you want. But I'm not going to tell you that a sculpture sells as fast or easy as a painting. Not true. You have thousands of years of data of rolled canvases and flat things on the wall that live in small, tight apartments very comfortably. So there is a bias in terms of market for 2D works. And I'm not going to sugarcoat that for you. That does not mean that you need to stop doing what you're doing in three dimensions and, and focus on that. But I want to give you that reality. Thank you so much. That was great advice. Um, we are at time. Is there any very pressing question from Adrian or Jessica? Otherwise, um, I would bring that. So don't feel you have to ask a question if maybe your questions have been answered anyway uh, during the conversation. Uh, maybe a quick question um, about some of us, you know, speaking of eating, some of us are, are Kind of going in the direction of teaching as well and Derek just I wanted to, under, to ask you like how do you navigate or traverse your career as an artist as well as immersing yourself in teaching or is that a symbiotic relationship? Adrian that's a good question I'm going to say that I think it's a bit dated um, that and I, and I think our teachers came up in a different art world you have to remember things are always changing so the world that our teachers inhabited the worlds that you guys inhabit there was no social media for most of, you know, the people teaching you, right? Things are different. So uh, I look at teaching as additive to my practice. I don't, I'm fortunate not to have the need to do it. If I were just starting out, I'm going to encourage you to do something else I did, which is like work a job that is like, doesn't require a lot from you. You can kind of be like a bit thoughtless. It's just got a good number attached to it. It doesn't take a lot of your time and energy. It doesn't drain you. And maybe it's like overnight shift. Maybe it's weekends. Maybe you're in a factory or something weird. Your family will not be impressed, Adrian. So don't talk about it. <laughs> it's the way that you can go to work and be a little mindless. Teaching requires a lot of giving. Sabine knows. I mean, at the end of the day, you're emotionally spent from talking to artists. You know, I do this as a labor of love. But if this were my job and I was trying to make my work, it'd be really tough. So I don't think that the, the pay is so great. You might even do better 
you know, working in a private school as a, doing a workshop two days a week, you know, rather than like, you know, signing up for a bunch of classes, trying to add up to, you know, make money to pay your rent. So be careful about the teaching thing as stability. And I don't want to, I hope nobody's throwing tomatoes at me. I'm just saying, <laughs> it, 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 look, remember making that work, Adrian, is most important. You, you're like a parent. You got to spend time with your babies, man, or they don't grow well. So do whatever you have to do that gives you time and energy. And remember, your time in the studio is not just when you're touching things. This is also the studio. So if this is full of all this obligation, you're, the work is not happening. So protect your mental space, protect your emotional output. That's also part of what happens in the studio. Um, so that, that's my two cents. I think that's very well said. I would like to that. I would like to add to that because what Derek just said is something that I've heard from a lot of our artists. Exactly that. Maybe not such great words, but they um, they voice the same. So Adrian, because one of the artists that we worked with for ten years, she um, she was teaching as a professor, and she says up to this day, you can see her work during those ten years wasn't as strong as the work before or after because it drained her of all her energy. It was also maybe a special uh, case in her situation, but she said that the students did take a lot of her energy in a good way, but you can see it in her work. So that, those were her comments. So I do think what Derek just voiced is something that others would probably also strongly underline and yeah. Anyway, I think uh, I have to thank you all very, very much. That was a very um, constructive and fruitful conversation. A great feedback from Derek. Uh, I hope um, it means a lot uh, uh, to you. I, I thought it was terrific uh, to just uh, listen to that kind of feedback uh, based on really virtual images. So wonderful. Uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Derek. Thanks so much, Andrea, for joining us. Um, I thought that was a a great, uh, a great event and uh, hope to see you all very soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, Thank everybody. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.